All right, so let's get started. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. And uh, we had started talking about discrete random variables, right? And we looked at one example of a discrete random variable, and we, we started talking about a second example. Um, let's revisit that first example really quick. I think it's helpful uh, in the comparison of these uh, because we have the same underlying phenomenon that we're, you know, that we're interpreting through the random variable. So, um, in the in the random variable x, right, we had some random variable x, right? We've got this R v x, and x represents the count of ones. It's the count of ones in uh, three uh, three places of a base three number where the elements are zero, one, and two. So let's look at that. Right, it looks something like this. This is the underlying phenomenon and the corresponding values of x if we are uh, considering, right, if we're considering this from the point of view of here's the uh, process that lies underneath Here's our interpretation of X, where um, you know we we've got these uh, we've got X as the interpretation, right? So what are the potential values of X? Is zero, one, or two? Uh, sorry, zero, one, two, three, or four. Um, but the underlying process is what leads us to that interpretation of X. And so um, let's consider a second random variable Y. So we've got this R V Y, and this is going to have the same, uh, the same phenomenon, right? It, it's built off of the same phenomenon, just counting in trinary, but we have a different outcome, and it looks something like this for Y. Now, how do we define Y? Y is going to be. Um, uh, whether y is zero, so we've got some rules here. So y is zero in the event of uh, two being present. Okay. Um, so let me just make a little room here. So y is zero if if two is present, right? Y. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if no two is present, let me just if there's no two present, and y is one if there is a two present, okay? And we can see, just looking at this chart, um, right, zero, zero, zero corresponds to zero, 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 one corresponds to zero, 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 two corresponds to one. We have a binary outcome here, right? It's either, y is either gonna be zero or one. It's not gonna be two, it's not gonna be three, it's not gonna be anything else. Um, and uh, but still, the underlying the underlying phenomenon, this counting, is the same thing that leads to x. Uh, sorry, uh, we define x on top of this counting. We define y on top of this counting. And so, you know, here is the underlying process. But this is not specifically what the R V is describing. The R V is describing, um, you know, the random variable y is describing whether or not there's a two present, right? Uh, so we can see y right here, right? This is y, and uh, x is describing um, the underlying phenomenon through the count of ones. And so x and y are very different here, right? And we can a we're asking different probabilities for x and y. So let's consider. A question related to why. I'll just get those out of there and we'll just consider why from here on out. So uh, in consideration of why we can ask some kind of question right like what is the probability what's the probability that y equals 1 and this is how we would frame this right so the probability that's with the p and then in parentheses uh, of y equaling one, what is that probability? 
So easy way that we can do this is we can count the ones, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Um, that doesn't seem quite right, does it? Ah, it's the probability of a two being present. My my bad, but, um, oh no, no, sorry, that is correct. I'm thinking of the phenomenon underneath it uh, and not the actual values of y. Um, so what was that? That was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, plus 12. So, uh, so that is 19. So that's gonna be 19 out of 27. What's the probability that y is zero? That's the other question. Uh, maybe another obvious question we could ask here. Um, that's going to be eight over 27. And so, so consider that this random variable and the random variable x are all sitting on top of the same phenomenon. I think that is an important thing to consider as we're looking at these. Okay, so uh, let's move forward from this. There is a type of function related to discrete distributions, okay? So discrete distributions have a type of function called a probability mass function. And those two questions above are essentially PMF. Uh, we call this the PMF, just to be clear. The probability mass function, PMF. Those questions above, the probability that y equals 1 or the probability that x equals 2, those are uh, probability mass function types of questions. Now, with those, we could just count things up. Um, I think in other instances, we might... Uh, we, you know, we're, we're specifying a specific value of the RV, of the discrete RV, right? So the form that this might take is the probability uh, that the random variable, let's say big X, is equal to little x. This is the form of a probability mass function, depending on the, you know, the style of the problem, depending on if it's a known distribution, depending on uh, how we construct the phenomenon, there are different ways uh, that this function can express. Uh, for those problems above, you know, we kind of, uh, we, we sort of built a function through counting. Um, we don't have necessarily a simple closed formula that we can express that with, but at the same time, uh, that was easy enough to do, right? Maybe this probability mass function is uh, some kind of you know, it's some Python uh, iterative approach, like the filtering we've done uh, so far. You know, this could be a literal Python function that we write, or it could be some closed mathematical fu function that uh, that is known, like the binomial PMF or the Poisson PMF or the geometric PMF or hypergeometric. Um, there, there's a number of PMFs that we know. Um, we'll cover a few of those here. Let me just uh, make sure I have Slack open for any questions. One moment. Okay. Uh, what's the conceptual difference difference between the mass and density concepts of PMF versus PDF? Uh, so the simple answer to that um, is that a PMF is looking for uh, a specific discrete value right? The PMF is looking for a specific discrete value. So uh, in those prior uh, examples, we were asking the question, for example, what is the probability that y equals 1? Um, 1 here is a specific discrete number. The P, uh, and, and this is because we're, we're dealing with the discrete distribution, right? Um, we're dealing with countable values. Uh, if we're dealing with a continuous distribution, there is the concept of a PDF um, and uh, a probability distribution function. And that, that function is going to give us 
uh, the probability of getting within a range of values, essentially, because uh, if you remember a continuous distribution, right, if we're thinking about time, um, you know, let's say we're wondering about the probability of getting this exact point in time, um, that exact point of time is going to be infinitely precise and it's going to be, uh, or sorry, it's going to be infinitely small uh, or precise and it's going to be divided by an infinitesimal number of moments, right, between this, right, all these moments, which means that we're going to have something very close to zero over something very close to infinity, which is going to be zero uh, if we try to figure out the probability that way. And so we actually want to put bounds on our uh, on our uh, on the values that we're looking for. Um, so instead of asking the question, what is the probability x is equal to something, um, the implied uh, form of a implied or explicit, depending on where it's represented, is going to be, say, the probability that, um, I don't know, let's say z, uh, you know, so let's do it like this, uh, z1 is less than big z, which is less than z2, right, where z1 is a lower value, z2 is a higher value, so we're looking for the probability within a range uh, when we're considering the PDF. Um, now, there, there's a little bit more complexity to that, and we'll talk about that when we get to, uh, to continuous distributions. Um, we're going to use the, uh, the PDF to extract a Y value given an X input, and we'll, we're actually going to think about it that way instead, uh, because we'll be constructing um, uh, what we call the cumulative density function uh, procedurally with Python. But um, for now, uh, the the distinction that that I, w I think is best to take away is that a probability mass function is looking for the probability of the discrete random variable being equal to a specific value. So that's how we want to think about the PMF. A way to differentiate that from the PDF is, uh, well, PDFs are for continuous distributions, and we're looking for a bounded uh, probability you know, uh, the bounded probability for some value. Um, what about density or PDF? Uh, so, so PDF, this D right here, um, people will say density for this, or they'll say distribution. Um, I always called it a probability density function. Um, I know there are a lot of people, uh, because that's what I learned in stats classes. Um, I know a lot of people will call it a probability distribution function. And um, I think I've been erring on the side of uh, density still, but um, that's what I'm describing when we're talking about, you know, we're looking for some bounded probability. Okay, so let's think. Let's get back to this probability uh, mass function idea. So uh, we can represent uh, discrete distributions in a number of ways, and and we will. Uh, so let's think about uh, let's think about this visually for a moment because I think that can be very helpful. Um, and I want I want you to consider that there are uh, an infinite number of distributions, and so. Uh, let's say we've got some distribution of values, and this is just going to look kind of like a histogram, right? So four, five, six, uh, let's say it's just zero through six, and um, we'll say that, you know, that's one, and that's two, right? And then this is four, and this is three, and this is five. Uh, and this is three, and this is one. So I don't know what created this distribution, uh, except for my pen, and you know whatever this is, 
these are the frequencies, let's say the count frequencies, um, you know, in the theoretical distribution. If we want to consider the probability, uh, and let's call this, um, let's call this A. So if we're considering the probability that A is going to equal four, how would we do that, right? How do we want to think about that? Um, well, the easiest way to think about that is um, this is five out of, you know, uh, four, nine, 12, 16, 18, 19. This is five out of 19. Five out of 19 occurrences um, are uh, of value four. So the probability that the random variable A is equal to four is going to be five out of 19. So this kind of uh, takes us to into the next concept. Um, so that's how we, can, we might be able to answer a probability mass function question given a visual representation of this. But there's a different kind of question that we're likely to um, that we're likely to come across, and uh, we're going to come across these a lot. There is the cumulative density function. Okay. So the cumulative density function answers uh, a different kind of question, and we call this the CDF. So. With the PMF, we can uh, we're, we're looking at the probability of a specific number of occurrences. With the CDF, we're looking at the probability of less than or equal to a certain number of occurrences. Uh, in general, that's what we'll be looking at. So, in this, with the CDF, we could answer a question such as, "What is the probability that a is uh, less than or equal to four? So we're going to solve this slightly differently. I think what was the total number of the, this? Nineteen, I believe. Um, I'll just double check that 12. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, 19. Okay, so out of 19, how many are less than or equal to four? Uh, that's going to be five plus three is eight, 12, uh, 14, 15. So the probability of that is 15 out of 19. So, you know, in this case, we're not solving for a specific value, we're solving for uh, you know, all of this, the probability of, of something, uh, you know, either five or, or sorry, either four or three or two or one or zero. And um, I want to point this out. Uh, another way that we can think about this is what is the probability? What is the probability? What's the probability that A is equal to zero? plus the probability uh, that a is equal to one, right? And so on up to, uh, you know, plus the probability that a is equal to four. This is the same, uh, this is the same concept, right? So um, either way of representing that uh, is essentially the cumulative density function. Now we're going to have explicit some explicit cumulative cumulative density functions. Um, we're also going to have some iterative cumulative density functions. We'll see that. So uh, the way to think about this, or a way to define this, just you know, is we can think of the CDF as being the sum of all probabilities up to and including a given outcome. And uh, again, the form of this. Uh, the more generalized form of this uh, CDF is going to be the probability that big X is less than or equal to little x, right? So that's our general form. Uh, notice the only difference between this and the P, the PMF is this less than or equal to sign, this less than or equal to sign. Okay, so, so now that we've got that, Let's consider um, uh, all possible four-bit binary words. So I've got that over here. And again, this is sort of this, uh, this counting approach that we've been talking about. Th this is all possible four-bit binary words uh, from 0000 to 1111. Um, if we define Z, okay? 
let's define a random variable z. Um, z is going to be the uh, the count of ones. Okay, so we could say let z represent the count of ones in a four bit binary word. So if we want to actually represent B, uh, Z, it's not going to be uh, this list of binary. That, that's not what that is. Um, it's going to be the equivalent counts, right? So it's going to be this. Uh, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so on until we get to 1, 1, 1, 1. And if we want to uh, make this a little more visual, we could say, um, well, let's make uh, just a quick histogram, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And let's count these. How many times does 0 occur? Uh, whoops. Let me actually draw on this. Uh, 0 occurs one time, right? So we can just do that. How many times does one occur? Well, let's count it. One, two, three, four times. So, right? So this is one, this is four. How many times does two occur? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many times does three occur? It occurs one, two, three, four times. And as, as we're going to see, this is going to be a symmetrical distribution about two. If we want to um, consider, if we want to think about the probability, <coughs> excuse me, the probability that Z is less than or equal to two, this is a cumulative uh, density question, right? Uh, probability that Z is less than or equal to two, well, that's going to be uh, 6 plus 4 plus 1, so that's 11 over, uh, you know, 11 plus 5 over 16. So in this case, we didn't need a formula to solve this. We have we can extrapolate this. We can figure this out from uh, some other representation of the distribution. It turns out there is a closed formula to solve this uh, called the binomial formula. This is actually a binomial distribution. And we're going to talk quite a bit about the binomial distribution when we get to it. Okay, so uh, that's our foundation in discrete random variables. And uh, from this, we're going to um, we're going to get into some coding. I think that um, a nice way to look at these discrete distributions is through the lens of of code. Um, where we look at the underlying, kind of the underlying process of them. Um, now, uh, this means that we're going to veer away from the mathematical form of them or the mathematical representations of them, kind of until the end. Uh, so we're going to go through these uh, these discrete discrete distributions as the phenomena that they are, and then we're going to pull the math uh, representations into that. Um, and part of that is just you know building up Python chops. That's what a lot a lot of this is about. And um, the first one that we'll consider, well, the first ones that we'll consider, um, I think we'll probably start with uh, uniform. Let's see, I've got, let me just look at my notes. I think we'll likely start with uniform. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we'll start with the uniform distribution. Uh, but more generally, we're talking about, or, you know, most generally, we're talking about the idea of a probability distribution, and um, I, I, rep I represented that visually in uh, in Z that we just looked at with that little histogram, that little symmetric histogram. So, a probability distribution is uh, essentially a representation of the frequencies or the frequency of outcomes, right? The frequency of outcomes of a discrete random variable, of a random variable, we'll say. 
okay? It's a representation of the frequency of outcomes of an RV. Now, we can think about this in a couple ways. Uh, we can think about this in terms of the actual probabilities, which, you know, if you multiply all the probabilities by some integer, then you get theoretical counts of, uh, of outcomes. Um, so the frequency can be represented by counts, right? It can be represented by probabilities. Um, in either case, uh, you can convert between counts and probabilities pretty easily, either by multiplying by a number of items or dividing by a number of items. So, um, so we'll we'll do a little bit of that, but uh, you know, keep in mind that what we will be interacting with is probability distributions. What we'll what we'll be talking about in terms of discrete probability distributions. Discrete probability distributions is, uh, let, let's just give these names. We're going to be talking about the uniform distribution, which is a very straightforward, uh, fairly simple to understand distribution. Uh, we'll be talking about what is often called a Bernoulli trial, um, although some people will use the word Bernoulli, the phrase Bernoulli distribution. I prefer Bernoulli trial, and you'll see why um, I prefer that, but either way is okay. Um, We'll talk about binomial. We'll talk about Poisson. And we'll talk about geometric. So these are all, uh, for our purposes, discrete distributions. Uniform, uh, we can have a uh, continuous uniform distribution as well. Um, so we can have a discrete uniform and a continuous uniform distribution. Uh, both, of, both of those will cover the current technical interviews refer to these distributions. Um, these are all potential distributions that are covered in the current uniform distribution. So uh, we're going to look at all of these through, from a couple different angles. Um, the binomial distribution, we're going to dig in from uh, all three of our analytic approach, you know, uh, all three types of analytic approach that we're going to do, um, you know, in terms of counting, oh, there we go. In terms of counting, in terms of sampling, and in terms of uh, a closed formula, in this case using the PMF. So um, we're putting a lot of focus on binomial. Uh, Part of that is that, um, well, both binomial and Poisson, but really binomial has um, a lot of representation in just, you know, across math. It comes up a lot. Um, it has uh, combinations implicit in the formula. It's, um, it's highly applicable to a lot of spaces. Um, I think uh, Poisson is being, you know, equally, uh, you know, important, but... Um, you know, we're going to, for the sake of time, um, not dive into sampling for Poisson. It is possible, but we're not going to do that. Um, we're just going to focus heavily on binomial and then, um, you know, uh, not quite as heavy on Poisson and then uh, somewhat lighter on geometric. Okay, cool. All right, so moving from there... Uh, I'm not going to define these all yet. Um, I could talk through them right now, but I think that generally will sort of get lost and we'll deal with these one at a time. And we'll start with a uniform distribution. So when we're thinking about uniform, uh, uniform is, is, turns out is very straightforward and uh, is kind of uh, nice to look at. Um, so for some range of discrete outcomes, every outcome has equal probability. So um, one nice way to think about this is a dice roll, right? Um, you know, a six-sided die roll is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Each of these is going to have equal probability. So, you know, essentially 
it's going to look like this. And uh, often we'll call this a flat distribution. You'll see it represented sort of like this. It's very easy to describe the PMF for something like this, right? If we want to ask, well, what is the probability that we'll say X represents the outcome from this uh, six-sided die roll? What is the probability that X is four? Well, there's just, um, oh, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five. Sorry. There we go. Um, we'll, we'll think of each of these as being uh, a region. So the region immediately to, to the top right. So if we're thinking about the probability that X is four, it's going to be just one, one out of six, right? There's just one out of six. Now, if we're trying to consider, uh, so that's our PMF, right? PMF problem, very easy. Uh, what is our CDF problem? Um, the uh, sort of equivalent CDF problem is going to be what is the probability X is less than or equal to four, which is going to be, um, it's going to be all of this, right? Which is just going to be four out of six, as it turns out, right? Or two thirds. So uniform is pretty straightforward, right? That, that's pretty easy. Um, we can break this down in a number of different ways, uh, but I think, you know, just remember, the main thing to remember with uniform is, is every outcome is equally likely in a uniform distribution. And that, that's going to apply for a continuous uniform distribution as well. So uh, we're going to cover continuous uniform a little more deeply than, than discrete uniform. I think this is pretty straightforward. I, uh, you can extrapolate a lot from this. So let's move on to the concept of a Bernoulli trial. We'll, we'll put more thought into a Bernoulli trial because this is going to be our building block for uh, explicitly for Bernoulli, sorry, explic uh, explicitly for binomial and geometric, but also Poisson to some degree. We can, we can think about Poisson in terms of Bernoulli trials as well. So um, we are going to have two distributions that we consider to be series of Bernoulli trials. That's going to be binomial and geometric. So let's think about this as being a single event with a binary outcome. Uh, and uh, it's a single event with a binary outcome, right? So it's either going to be true or false or zero or one or one item or the other item. That's how we're going to think about that. And there's a set probability. Set probability of P. So a Bernoulli trial has a fixed probability of P. So um, let's think of an example of a Bernoulli trial. I've got one here. And I think this is a helpful way to think about this. Um, if you have a bag full of red and blue balls, where you have 30 red balls and 70 blue balls, if you reach into the bag thousands of times and average the counts of these balls, what percentage would you expect of your draws would be red? Now, Think about that. There's uh, we used very convenient numbers here. There's 30 red and 70 blue, and you're going to pull. You know, you're just going to draw from this a thousand times. You're going to draw the ball. You're going to put it back. Draw in. Put it back. Draw in. Put it back. And we're asking, well, what is the probability of drawing a red ball? What are you going to see after you average all of that out? Um, well, you're probably going to see 30 out of 100, or you know, a probability of 0.3. So uh, this is a Bernoulli trial 
uh, when we get down to it. Not, not the draw of thousands of this, but a single draw is a Bernoulli trial. So you reach out, you reach in, and you pull out a ball. If that ball, uh, you know, you ask, well, what is the probability that this is red? That probability is 0.3. Probability that it's blue is going to be 0.7. So fairly simple in concept, um, but this uh, we can build this out to some really interesting things, okay? So I'm gonna have you do a breakout, but before, um, before we do that, I want to just quickly demonstrate uh, something that will, well, that you'll find helpful, okay? So um, I'm going to have you code a Bernoulli function but first I want to demonstrate this uh, random.random. .random. So I'm saying from random, import random, okay? And uh, let's print a single call to random and see what that looks like. So this will be Bernoulli. So we get uh, 0.8887 long float number. Um, we get a different long float number, 0 0.08 something, 0 0.294, uh, 0.4738, right? I can, I can do this all day. We're going to de get different values. It turns out that this is actually a uh, continuous uniform, well, pseudo continuous uniform distribution where we're getting values with equal probability between 0 and 1. So are we likely more likely to get 0 0.75 than 0.29? No. Um, those are equally likely. And uh, so that snippet of code from random import random, that's going to help you with solving a Bernoulli function. All right, so um, you're going to code the Bernoulli function. It'll have one argument uh, or one parameter defined, which is the probability of success. And uh, you're going to return a... Uh, either a 0 or a 1, where 0 represents, let's say, failure, 1 represents success, um, or you could say 0 represents false, 1 represents true. Um, either way, uh, you want to think about it. Uh, we tend to think of the results of a Bernoulli trial as being a failure or a success. We define what it means. Uh, we define what success means. We define what failure means. Um, and so, you know, uh, let, for this, we can just return 0 or 1. Um, you could return true or false. That would be fine, too. But, uh, you know, something that we can use mathematically. Um, yeah, so I'll set a timer for 4 minutes. And go ahead and code the Bernoulli function.
okay, let's let's code a solution to this. I think there's a couple of different ways you could do this. Um, let's, uh, I, I'll just show a way to do it. So, uh, oops, fair newly. And we'll put in the probability of success. All right, so um, I'm going to draw a number from random. And uh, if that draw is less than the probability of success, then we can return true. Otherwise, we can return false. So uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, we could also, uh, sorry, I think I said returning zero or one, didn't I? So let's do that instead. Let's return one or let's return zero. Oh no, I didn't explicitly say that. Um, well, let's do that. We'll think about one as success, zero as failure, and we can run this and see how it goes. So this is brand newly. Oh, <laughs> probably have to call the function in order for it to work. Okay. And we'll put this at 0.3. Uh, let's do 0.5 to start. Um, one thing I like doing with Bernoulli is uh, setting a default parameter, and uh, I'll generally set that to 0.5. Okay, so let's see what that gets us. Failure, 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 success, 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 failure, failure. Right, th this is going to generally uh, just work out that way. Now, if I set this uh, to point 0.1, it's going to be much less likely for us to get success, right? We should get see this about 1 out of 10 times. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oh, okay, we got it once. 8, 9, 10. You know. So we can see, we can see that this is working reasonably well um, for, you know. We, we could do a more rigorous test of it, uh, right? Just calling it a bunch of times and making sure, but... Uh, we can see that it's doing something like what it's supposed to do. Um, we could tighten this up a little bit. We could take random and we could just put it right here. We don't need to actually do that draw, as it were. Um, you know, we could uh, we could make this into a single line, but we don't need to do that. I think it's nicer to read that way. Okay. All right. Um, well. Yeah, why don't, why don't we verify this? Um, I think it's, it, it is probably a little helpful, I think, to, to verify these kinds of things to make sure that it is doing what we, what we think it should do. So how would we verify this? Um, let's think about this as uh, just a sampling process, right? So let's sample this um, a lot. Uh, how about 10 million times? Um, the, the way that we can do this is, um, well, I don't think you've seen too much in the way of comprehensions, but, uh, that's okay. Let's do this as, um, let's do this as, I don't know, let, let's just make a list and we'll do a for loop. So for, um, whatever in range, and this will be the number of trials. Um, let's say list dot append, and this is uh, will append the result of Bernoulli with some probability of success. And let's set that at 0.1. And um, when that's all when that's all done, we can take that list and count. Uh, the number of ones, and we can divide that by the number of trials, and we can just print that out. So that that should work. Uh, we we don't need to construct a list here necessarily. We could just make a counter. That would be completely legitimate. So let's see what that gets us. So it's going to take a little bit to run. 
And that is pretty close to 0.1, right? That, that's really close to our probability of success through that sampling process. Let's run it again. And now we're a little bit over one. Uh, so I think we can see here that this is, you know, this is doing what we'd expect it to do. I'm gonna tighten this up a little bit. I'm going to make a comprehension uh, just to, well, how about this? I will, I'll comment this out before I do that. So um, this is just gonna be a list comprehension um, where we call Bernoulli a certain number of times. Uh, let's see, point one and or whatever in range that'll be the number of trials and then same thing as before let's count the ones and divide by the number of trials so let's just see what that gets us uh it should run a little bit faster just slightly but um but yeah it's going to get us the same result all right so i'll share this um I'm just showing the comprehensions because there's going to be a point where you'll be writing comprehensions uh, more often. And uh, you don't need to be able to do that for the technical interview. It's fine um, to write these sort of, uh, you know, bigger open for loops with an accumulator. But comprehensions, once you get the hang of them, are really, really great. Okay. So that's essentially Bernoulli. Um, it's, it's pretty simple, right? It's just, uh, you know, a good way to think about this, to tie it back into the real world. Think about it like a coin flip, right? A single coin flip. A Bernoulli trial is like a single coin flip. If you have an unfair coin, you're going to vary the probability. But, um, you know, a coin flip, if it's a fair coin, is going to be a, pro a probability of success of 0.5. You're either going to get a heads, which we can think about as success, or a tails, which we think about as failure. So, um, you know, you don't want to only think about it as a coin flip, right? There are other things that you might be doing. You might be observing a part to see if it is in a state of failure. Um, and maybe there's a probability that it'll be in a state of failure. If it's in a state of failure, um, then let's say that's a success. If it's, a, if it's operational, we can say, well, in terms of that observation, that's a failure, right? You didn't discover a failed component. So um, we often will change the story uh, in terms of Bernoulli, but really it's just an observation on a binary outcome and, that has a fixed probability. So from Bernoulli, we, uh, we're going to build binomial. And uh, the, the reasoning here is that binomial turns out to be a series of Bernoulli trials. Where what we are specifically interested in is the uh, number of successes in N trials, okay? So we're considering K successes in N trials. the probability of success is uh, constant over the trials. So we have a fixed probability of success, or we'll just call it P, so a fixed P. All right, so K successes in N trials. What is this going to look like? Um, well, we can tie this back to binary, which is what we're gonna do in general. We're going to think about binomial first in terms of binary. So um, let's say we have n of 8, and we're wondering about the probability k of 6 successes in 8 trials where there's a probability of 0.5. Well, to really think about this, to really consider this, we're going to have to think about all the versions of events that have Eight, uh, six successes in n trials. So what does that look like? Well, here's one version of that. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, 1, 1. Yeah. So that's one version of that. 
here's another version. Um, here's another version. And so on. So uh, if you think about this, this starts looking uh, like a counting problem. And we're going to see in the PMF for a binomial when we get to it, uh, combinations is explicitly in it. Uh, before we get there, though, we're going to um, explore this in, uh, in the three modalities that we've talked about through counting, through sampling, and then we'll look at this in terms of the closed formula. Okay, so uh, I know we've kind of touched on this more than once, but we're going to count in binary, okay? So let's count in binary. Um, again, this is, a, uh, this is a base two system, right? This is base two. There are two symbols we're going to use. We're going to use a zero or a one. And uh, we're going to, for our purposes here, um, and you'll see why in just a little bit, we're going to compare decimal, which we think about often as dec. We're going to compare this to binary, which we often will call bin. So the dec to bin comparison. If we are counting in binary, in one bit, that, that's how we would call this, one bit binary, there's one bit that we're considering, either zero or one, right? Uh, that's a number of length one, one bit. We can represent either zero or one in decimal. So these are equivalent in, in the way we're thinking about this. Let's change this to two bit binary. This is going to go zero, zero, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is going to be uh, in decimal, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay? Um, if we want to take this a little bit further, we can think about a uh, 3-bit binary. And uh, I might run out of room here. I might not. And we can go up to seven, okay? So how are we counting here? Um, well, there's only two symbols. So once we get to one, one is going to flip over back to zero. And we also increment this next uh, value to the right. And then uh, when we get to one, one, both of these are going to roll over to zero and increment you know, the next one over here. So uh, this is just like counting in decimal or any other number system, except we have less symbols to work with. So this is decimal to binary in this representation. Uh, the way your computer represents this is different, just to be, just to be clear. But um, this is a way that we can consider this and uh, leverage this for our purposes coming up. So let's consider what we call a binary word. Um, I don't know exactly why we call this a word, but a binary number, we tend to refer to it as a word. So let's consider the binary word 10110110. If we want to convert this from binary to decimal, that's not so hard to do, okay? So uh, this will be one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero. In decimal, we have the ones place. Uh, yes, I'm saying binary word. Uh, we call a binary number, we tend to call this a binary word. Why do we do that? I'm, I'm not sure offhand, but um, I think I did learn why a long time ago, but that also doesn't seem important enough <laughs> for me to have remembered. Uh, but we, we do refer to these as binary words um, for one reason or another. Yep, 10110110 is a binary word. 
this could be any uh, any string of ones and zeros, and we would consider it to be a binary word, just to be clear. So um, if we want to convert this from binary into decimal, we want to think about this in terms of place values. So this furthest uh, bit to the right, this is a single bit, zero. This furthest bit to the right is the ones place. So this is the ones place. And given that it's binary and there's only two symbols, then this next place is the twos place. And you know, if you think about this in relationship to a decimal number like 934, this is the ones place, this is the tens place, this is the hundreds place, right? It's a 10 symbol system. So in a two symbol system, we're going to do this a little bit differently. We're just going to think about this in powers of two. So this is the ones place, this is the twos place, this is the fours place, the eights place, 16's place, uh, 30 seconds place. Uh, oh wait, did I skip one? One, two, four, eight, 16, 32. Oh no, I didn't. Okay, 64's, uh, 128's place. And the way that we're going to think about this is that this is just zero times one, one times two, one times four, zero times eight, one times 16, one times 32, uh, zero times 64, one times 128. And we're gonna add all of these results together. So zero times one is zero, one times two is two, one times four is four, zero times eight is zero, one times 16 is 16, one times 32 is 32, zero times 64 is zero, one times 128 is 128. If we add all these up, uh, that's 160, 176, 182. So this binary word, if we translate it into decimal, well, using this scheme, if we translate it into decimal, is the decimal value 182. So that's fairly easy to, uh, to figure out in that direction. Um, so here's a question. What is the maximum decimal value that we can represent with one bit binary? Or sorry, with eight bit binary. This is eight bit. This is an eight bit word right here, right? This is eight bits. There are eight zeros and ones. Um, what is the maximum number that we can represent? Yeah, yeah. It's two fifty five. Yeah, and that's if every one of these values has. Uh, if every one of these binary values is one. Then we're just going to add 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. And that's going to get us 255. Why isn't it 256? It's because we include 0. All zeros is 0. Um, and so we, we don't get 256, we get 255. Okay. So I'm going to write a function here to generate, uh, to count in 4-bit binary. And this is going to be our starting point, um, but we're going to make this a little bit better as we go. So let's call this generate for bit binary. And uh, we've, we've done, we've essentially done this before, something like this. Um, although this time we're going to pack values into a dictionary. So I'm gonna say for i in range two, Uh, for j in range 2, uh, j, k, l, we can uh, take this dictionary and as the key, for the key we're going to make, uh, we're going to put the decimal value and for the value we're going to put the uh, binary in a word, uh, sorry, in a list. And uh, on every round of this, we're going to want to increment our decimal value. And at the end of this, we can just return this binary dictionary. Uh, let me take a look at that question. Um, ah, how did I get the 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, 32, 64? Uh, yes, because it's 2-bit, right? So uh, the, most, the rightmost place is going to be the 1's place. The second place is going to be the 2's, then the 4's, then the 8's, 16's, 32's. Um, and uh, 
given that place value, that's, uh, that place value is how we can translate from binary into decimal. Um, in this case, uh, we're going to see, you know, in, in the traversal of this, uh, this function, I'll, I'll say for dec and binary in uh, generate for bit binary, uh, let's print the decimal value in relation to the binary value. So dec, and we'll relate that to binary. Uh, and also be careful, uh, this word, this, this is a reserved word, bin is a reserved word, so I'm doing bin underscore. Ooh, there we go, okay. So let's just take a look at this. Oh, I don't wanna run Bernoulli, I wanna run binomial. Okay, cannot pack, unpack non-iterable int object, uh, that's fair. Let's put dot items. And here we have the direct representation, right? Zero is zero, 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 zero. One is zero, 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 one. Two is zero, zero, one, zero, and so on until we get to 15, which is all ones. So that's one way we can count. It's a little bit cumbersome, right? If we wanna make an eight bit word, we're going to have to um, have eight nested loops. And, and so at this point, um, you know, I want, I want to introduce an algorithm um, that is one of the, it's one of the classics in uh, computer science. Uh, I think it's a good algorithm to learn. It, you know, gives you a sense of, uh, of numbers. It gives you uh, of number theory, right? And it gives you a sense of how we can think about algorithms in general. So um, this algorithm is called dec to bin. And this is going to be the decimal to binary algorithm. Um, let's take a five minute break and, or let's take a six minute break. And when we get back, we'll look at the decimal to binary uh, converter. And I'll actually, uh, we'll look at the algorithm and I'll have you all code it. Okay, I'll see y'all back here in about six minutes.
All right, so let's consider the uh, this algorithm, the decimal to binary or deck to bin algorithm. Um, we're going to uh, take a decimal number. So we're, we're going to start with a decimal number. Given a decimal number, we're going to uh, take the mod by 2. So take modulus by 2. Then we're going to set aside the result of that. Notice that is going to be a 0 or a 1, right? Set aside the result. We're going to then floor divide by 2. And uh, we're going to do that until um, the number is 0. When that's all said and done, we're going to reverse we're going to reverse the sequence of zeros and ones. All right. So uh, let me demonstrate this. We'll demonstrate this with the number 43. So given 43, and you know, let me let me snag a printed version of this so that y'all have it. So we've got this. Given a decimal number, take mod by 2, set aside the result, floor divide by 2 until the number is 0, and then reverse the sequence of outcomes. Okay, so we've got a decimal number, 43. 43 mod 2 is going to be 1. 43 floor divide 2 is going to be 21. 21 mod 2 is going to be 1. Uh, 21 floor divided by 2 is going to be 10. 10 mod 2 is going to be 0. Uh, 10 floor divided by 2 is going to be 5, right? 5 mod 2 is going to be 1. 5 floor divided by 2 is going to be 2, right? 2.5, round down to 2. Okay. So 2 mod 2 is going to be 0. 2 floor divided by 2 is going to be 1. 1 mod 2 is going to be 1. And then 1 floor divided, floor divided by 2 is going to be 0, right? And of course, after that, zero, uh, 0 mod 2 is going to be 0, just indefinitely, right? So. Uh, the last step of this is um, we reverse these outcomes. So we say z 1, 0, 1, starting from the bottom, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Turns out that this is decimal for 43. If we want to verify that, here's the 1's place. So 1 times 1 plus uh, 1 times 2. Uh, so 1's, 2's, right? This is 4's, 8's, 16's, 32's. Uh, it might be easier just to do it like this. Um, 32 plus 8 is 40, plus 2 is 42, plus 1 is 43. Uh, we can see that this is indeed 43. So that's just a simple, nifty little algorithm. Um, and I think it's good practice. We're going to use this to, uh, to further explore binomial. So um, I'm going to give you this breakout for coding the deck to bin function. So here's this. Let me make sure that this, uh, that the algorithm itself is visible. And yeah, I'll just set a timer for six minutes. Um, so deck to bin should uh, take two things as input right? It should take the decimal value and it should take the number of bits. Now, if you can't figure out the number of bits part, that's okay. Um, you can just implement the algorithm without the number of bits parameter. But um, when, I, when I demonstrate the solution, I'll include the number of bits. And we're going to see how that's important for uh, using this in a binomial process. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later. So this number of bits is uh, optional, but um, you know, 
try to think about how to do it. If you can't get to that, that's fine. Okay, so six minutes and go for it.
All right, so let's go ahead and code this out. Uh, I noticed a, a few of you got uh, got to good solutions on it, so that's awesome. And um, yeah, we'll just implement a solution, and this is going to include the uh, the uh, what do you call it? The parameter the, of n bits, the number of bits. Okay, so um, this is going to be called deck to bin, and we're going to pass in a decimal number and a number of bits, which by default, I'll set it to eight. We could do 16 or 32, uh, 64. Those are all common bit lengths, but um, for our purposes, eight will be fine. So here's our, uh, oops, our collector, and um, we're going to uh, I'm going to make a copy of the decimal number because I'm going to be modifying it. And in general, you don't want to modify something you pass into a function. Um, I'm saying in general because that's not, not always going to hold true. Um, but that is going to be true in this case. I'm not going to modify dec in this case. So for whatever in range, this is going to be the number of bits. So I'm going to explicitly run this n bits times. That's going to pad the left of my number with zeros um, in the event that... Uh, we bottom out the number before we, um, well, if we bottom out the number, then we'll keep adding zeros for whatever number of bits that we have. And um, we can take the bit out of this operation. So we get a bit uh, when we take x mod 2. It's either going to be a 0 or a 1. And then I'm just going to append these to a list, to that binary list. And at that point, we can modify... Uh, we can just floor divide by two, right? So that's really the whole algorithm. Um, the last part of this is we need to reverse. Uh, we need to reverse our binary list in order to have an accurate representation. Um, another way we could do this is uh, doing list of reversed of the binary list. This is fine. Um, uh, I think it's a better practice to do this, uh, just use slicing, uh, reverse index slicing. Um, so that's the way I'm gonna do that. Let's see if that gives us what we expect to see if decimal is equal to 43. So let's try that out. So 101011, we can see right there that that's working. And we're padding two zeros to the left because um, we're enforcing eight bits. If I change this to 32 bits, we're gonna see a whole lot of zeros to the left, right? We're seeing a ton of them. Um, so that looks like a working function. And I'll go ahead and paste this in. Um, ah, yes. For reversed, you have to put the list inside the parentheses um, because uh, exactly reversed will essentially return a reference to something uh, that you can iterate over, but you need to cast that to a list. The list will do that uh, operation and pack in a list from the reversed object. So um, exactly, yeah, um, we just need to put in a list. Uh, what output did I get when I ran uh, decimal 43 with uh, n bits 32? That is right here uh, with n bits set to 32. Um, with n bits set to 8, I'll go ahead and just paste this in the Slack. Um, we got 101011, which is what we expected, right? Uh, oh, I, I think I erased it over here. Let's see. There it is, 101011, just like we wanted. Okay. All right, so... Um, we've got this working decimal to binary function. We're going to take this uh, a bit further into, um, into essentially a representation of binomial. Now, um, the interim step I'm going to take for this is uh, I'm going to write a function called get binary. Okay. So get binary, I'm going to get all the binary for a certain number of bits. And 
when we're thinking about an 8-bit binary word, we can think of that as being 8 Bernoulli trials in a binomial process, okay? Um, and I think that's important enough to say again, when we're thinking about an 8-bit binary word that is a representation of 8 successes or failures in a binomial process, and we can use that to construct a binomial distribution. So um, if we've got 8 bits, that could be fail, 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 right? That's eight failures in a row. Or it could be fail, 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 success. Or fail, 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 success, fail. Right, I'm just counting in 8-bit binary. Um, it's easier to see this when we do 4-bit binary, right? Because it's easier to count in 4-bit binary. It's not quite as long. But if we're going to do four nested loops to try to build out every possible um, sequence of outcomes that might lead to one success or two successes or three successes all the way to up, up to eight successes, uh, having eight nested loops is a little bit not great. And now with this uh, deck to bin function, we can, uh, we can do this much more easily for different numbers of Bernoulli trials in a binomial process. And I'll just demonstrate this. So I'm gonna make a dictionary and uh, for decimal in range and the number of possible values is two to the number of bits. I've been sort of harping on this for a while. Uh, we have a certain number of sim uh, symbols, right? In binary, we've got two symbols. We've got a certain number, uh, a certain length of our number of our word in this case. Um, and this is going to be two symbols raised to the number of bits or the length of the number. Um, for every uh, decimal value, uh, I'll set decimal as key, as the key. We're going to have a uh, we're going to have a representation in binary. Okay, so uh, we can do that, and then we can return that bin binary dictionary, and we can look at this. So for decimal binary in uh, get binary with n bits of eight, we'll just do this for eight bits, just to keep it. Um, rel relatively short, we can print the decimal value and we can print the binary itself. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. We've got uh, in decimal 0 to 255 and we've got all the binary, uh, we've got the entire um, list of binary that that works out to. So that's pretty easy, I think. I think that's something that we can see. And I'll go ahead and share that. So this is just packing in a dictionary. And we're going to make use of this uh, very shortly to, uh, to look at the number of successes, the frequency of successes in a certain number of trials. In this case, we're going to be kind of fixated on the probability of 0.5, okay? Right, because when we think about uh, what we'll call the parameters to the binomial PMF. So the binomial PMF parameters, we've got three of them that we want to consider. We've got n, which is the number of trials, right? Uh, in this case, that's the number of bits. Uh, so eight bits is equivalent to eight trials because we can either have a one or a zero, success or a failure. We've got k, which is the number of successes for which we're trying to find the probability in n trials, right? And then we've got the probability, which is uh, the probability of success on any given trial that stays constant across all the trials. And uh, for us, this is going to, uh, you know, in this approach, we're going to leave this at 0.5. That's going to be fixed just by the nature of how we did this. So, um, and we'll, we'll find a way to vary the probability uh, a little bit later. Okay. So, um, you know, just to re reiterate this point, a binary number or word, uh, we can think of it as representing a series of successes and failures in the order of those trials happening. So, uh, we can 
construct uh, this binomial distribution for n trials with a probability of 0.5, as I said. Um, this is only going to work for 0.5, but that's okay. Um, we'll find other ways to do this. So I'm going to call this, I'll just call this binomial distribution, and we'll put in the number of trials as 8. Um, of course, that's going to lead us to n bits of 8, but you know we will think about this from here on out as the number of trials. So let's set up a dictionary. This is where we're going to collect our values. So this binary dictionary uh, will set get binary and bits is going to be the number of trials, right? As I said, we'll say for whatever, we're going to throw away the decimal number. We don't really care about the decimal number, right? We're just using the decimal number as a way to effectively get all the binary we want. So we can throw that away. So for whatever, and then the, um, you know, binary word, I'll call that in bindict.items, we can sum the bits, right? Uh, the sum of the bits is just the count of the ones or the count of the successes. So uh, that's that should be pretty straightforward. We can just sum that binary word like so. And then we want to ask a question. If the sum of the bits is not already in the binomial dictionary, then we can simply uh, put it in there. So binomial dictionary sub uh, the sum of the bits. Uh, I'll initialize that to zero. Again, this is how I tend to do this. And then I increment it by one. And that's it. We can then return the binomial dictionary. Okay, so this is going to give us a list of counts. And uh, well, let's just see what that is. Okay, so I'll get this out. Um, this will be uh, a call to the binomial distribution function. And first, let's look at the counts. So for key value in d.items, um, let's print the f string of the key and uh, the value. So this is going to be a, a representation of the binomial distribution with a probability of 0.5 and eight trials. And uh, we're going to see the counts for each value of K theoretically. So in eight trials, um, the theoretical distribution would have four successes occurring 70 times, three and five successes occurring 56 times, two and six occurring 28, one and seven occurring eight times. Notice this is symmetric and that makes sense. And our modal value, our most common value, is going to be 4, which is the probability times the number of trials, right? So our expectation for a binomial distribution is going to be the probability multiplied by the number of trials. That's uh, something that we'll see over and over again um, over the course of this and probably into the next lecture. Okay, so if we want to look at the probabilities of this, we just need to change change this up a little bit. And um, what we can do, we can leave the key as the same. The key is just the number of successes, right? Um, but the value at this point, we can just uh, divide that by the sum of all the values, right? And uh, for this, I'm just going to round it. I think it's nice. I don't know. It's, it, it'll look a little nicer if we round it. Um, at some point, we start losing meaning. Um, in the uh, precision that is offered to us by our computers. And here we have a probability distribution um, instead of a distribution of counts. And we can see that the most probable item, of course, is four successes out of eight trials with a probability of 0.5. And that looks like about uh, 0.273 probability. Uh, v is the counts. Um, and then v divided by the sum of d dot values of uh, you know all the values is going to be the probability. Um, so uh, in this first in the first representation of this in our counts dictionary, um, v is the count of how many times um, four successes occurred in eight trials, which in uh, in this case was seventy times, and five occurred fifty six times. 
And then if we just sum all of those, uh, all of these counts, we can use that as the divisor of each individual um, count to look at the probabilities. So um, this approach, we're going to repeat this kind of approach multiple times, as it turns out. Um, let me make sure I'm pasting everything in here. Get binary, did I paste that in? I did, okay, great. Oops, I did not paste all of it. Okay. All right, so this is uh, this code is good code to study. Um, just to be clear, it it involves uh, packing in a dictionary. It involves a you know kind of this longer procedure. It, it's a little in depth, right? Where we um, use deck to bin and we leverage these decimal values, the counts of decimals, to build these binary words, and then we sum the bits, sum the ones in these binary words in order to um, look at the number of successes in n trials, in n bits trials, however we want to think about that. So this is, uh, through a counting approach, we've exhaustively uh, represented the actual, uh, an actual theoretical distribution without using the binomial PMF explicitly. However, we can think about the binomial PMF if we were to ask, you know, the question, what is the probability of, um, you know, getting three successes in eight trials with a probability of 0.5? Well, that's 0.21 um, or 0.22 roughly. It, that, that's the same number that you're going to get with the binomial PMF. This is not going to be different from the binomial PMF, the closed formula. Um, so uh, we are not using the binomial PMF here but we are still able to construct a probability mass function. It's just a little bit longer in a procedural sense. Um, when we get to the binomial PMF, you'll see how easy that actually is to just, you know, code up a function and have it work. Um, it'll just be a direct representation of a mathematical function. This is a, a little bit more complex in terms of setting this up. Sure. Uh, so, um, there's uh, to to re to reiterate what I what I mentioned yesterday. Um, I see there being closed formula solutions where we just write a function that has a formula, and we just return the result of that formula. We pass values into it and return the results. Um, I don't really have a definition for an open formula. Uh, closed formula just it, it's not really open versus closed formula it's just there's closed formula approaches where we have a formula that, that does what uh, you know like here we've got a lot of complexity and we've taken a counting approach um, next we're going to take a sampling approach and then we're going to take a closed formula approach but there's no open formula approach if that makes sense these are just uh, more complex uh, like this is very procedural but it gets us an exact result uh, the sampling approach is procedural but does not get us an exact result. And a closed formula approach uh, is very direct, very low in terms of computation cost, and does get us an exact result. Yeah, I, I know it's confusing. Uh, we, we always think of closed in relation to, to open, but um, this is not in relation to open. This is just, we call it a closed formula approach because um, we have a math formula that just gives us an answer. All right, so um, I'm not going to give you this next breakout, but I do want to show it to you uh, to give you a sense of how we might use this. So here's our premise. You flip a coin 12 times. N is the number of Bernoulli trials. K is the number of successes uh, for which we want the probability, and P is the probability of success on any given trial. The question is, what is the probability? And I'll 
put this up here too. What is the probability that you get nine heads in 12 flips? So that's question one. And then question two is going to be, what is the probability of getting four or less heads in 12 flips? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and answer these uh, in the interest of time. And, and to just give you sort of a, a sense of how we might think about this. So uh, what are the values for n, k, and p for that first question? Well, let's think about it. So, um, so this is the probability uh, where n is 12, k is 9, and the probability is 0.5, right? This is a binomial uh, approach. And um, we can answer this with uh, the code that we have above. So we're going to just build another dictionary. This is a little, a little cumbersome because we have to put in, you know, the number of trials, and then we can print uh, we can just print D. Uh, I'm not going to exactly traverse this. Actually, let's print D sub nine, right? So this should be the count of, of values in nine. And then we can divide by D dot values, the sum of D dot values, right? And uh, I'm just going to round this to, you know, five places or so. Okay, so this is going to answer that first question, hopefully. Uh, okay. Let's, oh, <laughs> I'm not rounding it with, uh, here we go. I rounded it up to an even number. Okay, so roughly 0 0.0537. And if we wanted to see this in the context of the entire distribution, we could, we could just print D, uh, you know, the, the version of D where we're dividing each value by uh, the sum of the values. So that answers the first question. Um, what's the probability that you get nine heads in 12 flips? Um, let's consider the second question. Uh, what is the probability of getting four or less heads in 12 flips? Well, let's, uh, let's do this. Let me, um, this will answer our first question. And let's say uh, the second question is going to be the probability uh, where n is 12, k is less than or equal to 4, and the probability is 0.5. Okay, so for this, we can just say for, uh, you know, um, k in range, and we'll make a collector here. Uh, sorry, we'll make an accumulator. Um, so this will be the probability, which will start at 0. So for k in range, we'll go from 0 up to 4 inclusive. And we're going to say the probability is going to be incremented by, I'll just snag all of this, d sub k divided by the sum of d uh, dot values. And uh, I'm not going to round this. I'm just going to do this and then I'll round uh, Prava down here. So print will round Prava to five. Okay. So uh, that's about 0 0.194. Uh, the probability of getting four or less successes in 12 trials with a probability of 0 0.5 is about 0 0.19, uh, 0 0.194. Now, what I want to uh, point out is that, you know, this is a CDF question. How did I perform the CDF? Well, I accumulated. Uh, the CDF will generally follow an accumulator pattern unless we have a closed formula to represent it. And uh, we'll see that as we go forward. Okay, so let me paste that in. All right. All right. So let's, well, let's, how much time do we have? Uh, let's start in on understanding binomial through sampling. 
So we just approached binomial through counting, okay? We counted and then we got this distribution of counts and a distribution of uh, a probability distribution where we could see the relative probabilities for each value of k. Now, those are theoretically strong. Those are theoretically accurate. They, those are not estimations. They are the same thing we would get using the binomial PMF formula that is uh, fixed, right? That, that is the theoretical uh, probability. Sampling is not going to get us a theoretical probability, okay? So uh, the reason for that is we're sampling, right? We're, we're making a pool of things and we're drawing from that pool and uh, we're gonna get variation on each trial. So um, sampling, uh, we're gonna go back to a function that we used before. So from random, import choice, and we're going to, uh, first we're going to get a bit, which is just going to be the choice between 0 and 1. Pretty straightforward. And then we can generate n bits. So let's generate n bits. Uh, and we'll default that to 8. Why not? And this is going to be simply, well, we make a list. We say for whatever in range n. And then list.append. We can just append getting the bit. Uh, you can probably think of a way that we could make this a little bit uh, smaller, right? We could just do something like this. Do we need that extra helper function? Probably not. So I'll just throw that away. And then we can return that list. Now we can tighten this up a little bit by making it a comprehension. So I'll just write this as a comprehension, rewrite it as a comprehension, where we can just say um, it's this choice again. It's the choice for whatever in range n, which is nice, right? That's, I don't know, uh, you know, two lines of code and we get a working function. So if we want to see a random binary word that's generated, uh, we've got it right here. So let's print generate n bits and we'll set n to 8. And let's see what we get. So we get almost all ones and then zero. We get uh, one, 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 zero, one, one, zero. Um, right? If I run this over and over again, we're going to get different values. Uh, we're going to get different lists of binary. So that's our starting point. And uh, from here, we can start sampling. We can really start sampling. Um, so Let's see, we have about 10 minutes. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of wanna, I wanna give you this breakout and see how it goes. Um, yeah, let, let's do this, let's do this. All right, so you're gonna write a function called binary sampling dic dictionary, okay? Um, looks uh, looks like this. It's going to have uh, two parameters, the number of bits and the number of samples. Of course, this is going to call back to the functions I just pasted in the Slack. So um, you're, you're going to return a dictionary where the keys represent the number of successes, right, which is the sum of ones in a given sample, and the values associated with those keys represent the count of that number of successes occurring. So um, what that might look like well, let me just give you another little snippet here as an example. So you might have a dictionary where there are 35 uh, zeros and 63 ones. And, you know, of course, it's going to grow up until um, that middle value. Uh, you know, whatever the probability is, you know, which is going to be 0.5 for our purposes, 0.5 times uh, the number of bits. And just recall, or just remember that the number of successes is just the count of ones or the sum of ones in a binary word. Okay, so I'll put this up here in case you need to reference it. And let's do five minutes on this and that should give us time to work a solution right before we wrap up. Go for it.
All right, so we don't have much time, so I'll code this pretty quickly. Um, this, uh, this process is, is sort of a generic uh, sampling process, and it's something that we're gonna see you know, a couple more times before uh, the end of the course. Um, so I'm gonna make a binary sampling dictionary uh, with a certain number of bits, I'll default that to eight, and a certain number of samples, which I'll default to a thousand, okay? Um, I'm going to set up a dictionary as a collector, and uh, we're gonna say for whatever in range, this is going to be the number of samples, and then uh, we're going to get some binary. So generate n bits, and we're gonna pass in the number of bits that we want. Uh, we're going, I'm just gonna make this observed k just to be very explicit about it. This is the sum of the binary. Uh, next, if that observed uh, value of k is not in the dictionary, this is that checking for membership, then we're going to add it in. Uh, I'll initialize it to zero again and increment it by one. Uh, ultimately, we return the dictionary. So uh, in order to see this, uh, to kind of cleanly see this, um, let's try a certain number of samples. And we'll start off with 100 samples. And I'm going to let, let the way that I'm going to show this is with a display of the probabilities, not the counts. Um, notice that I'm using 16 trials and a hundred samples, okay? That's a hundred samples, okay? 16 trials, a hundred samples. And let's just take a look at, at this. Uh, Built-in function, object is not iterable, on line 118. Okay, KV inserted, oh, d.items, d1. Hmm, ah, that should be, that should have parentheses. Okay, let's try it again. Um, so notice, we're not even representing 0, 1, or 2, or 3 in successes, or 14, 15, or 16. We haven't taken enough samples here. Uh, that's only 100 samples. Can we really trust these results? Not really. Um, so let's try that again with 1,000 samples. And I'm doing this just to you know, make a point. Um, you know, the more samples, the better might be the simple version of that point. But uh, you know, we gain surety by sampling more, I, I think is maybe a better way to say that. So in this case, uh, we're still not getting zero or one, but that's fine. I think we have a little bit more surety about the samples that we're actually seeing. Um, and here we're very clearly seeing eight as being stand out as opposed to, um, at, you know, as being the, the mean or the expectation, we would expect to see eight successes in 16 trials with a probability of 0.5, right? Um, Whereas uh, we're not clearly seeing that in this 100 sample version. Um, so let's stop there. We'll pick up with this sampling process. Uh, we'll take it just a little bit further and then we'll get into a closed formula approach before we move on to the Poisson and geometric distributions. So uh, give me one moment.